Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down. We're asking questions. Questions like, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love to a world, let's face it, don't know God for sure, and definitely is in deep need of more love, don't you think? How can I take these scriptures and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a light in this darkness? I want to be a tool in the hand of God making present His kingdom, not someday, but today and every day, and that's what this show is all about. So glad you could join us today. Oh, we got a good one. It's the raising of Lazarus, coming from the Gospel of John. Now, of course, John is the fourth Gospel to be written, the last Gospel to be written. John is completely different than the first three, known as the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Synoptics meaning Greek, one eye. They kind of all see it from the same perspective. But John's different. John's very different. John does not use the word miracle. He uses the word sign. And there's seven signs in the Gospel of John. The first one is the wedding of Cana, when he changes, Jesus changes water into wine. And the last and the greatest sign in the Gospel of John is our Gospel today, which is the raising of Lazarus. And this is a very deep pool, my friend. So I want you to take the roast beef out of your ears and really hear this. Because this gospel can change you. This gospel was designed to wake you up. So what do you say? I quit yipping about it. We get right on into it. We're hearing from the gospel of John. And we're going to read the shorter version because the longer version is just too long. The sisters of Lazarus sent word to Jesus saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but is for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go back to Judea. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise. Martha said, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I've come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. He became perturbed and deeply troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? They said to him, sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him? But some of them said, could not the one who opened up the man born blind have done something so this man would not have died? So again, Jesus is perturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now... There will be a stench. He's been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. But because of the crowd, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to him, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary and seen what had been done 
began to believe in him. The gospel of the Lord. Like I said, my friend, this is a deep pool. Call in the kids. It's going to be great. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapman. You hang out. We'll be right back. And we are going to talk about this gospel and a few other things here as we consider God's word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. It is such a pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and share the good news, but it's a bit expensive. So I would ask you to consider grabbing a piece of paper and a pencil, and at the next break, I'm gonna share with you some details how you can become a partner with Daily Living, and together, we can take the good news to a lost world. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. Now, if you've been watching this program for any amount of time, you know that we're all about finding the deeper meanings of Scripture. Because let me tell you, no matter what Scripture you might find yourselves reading, there's always a deeper meaning. No matter how many times you might have read that Scripture, no matter how much you think you already know about that Scripture, if you're seeking the wisdom of God, it will pull you in deeper because that's just what it does. Scripture is alive. It's unlike any other book. You could study the encyclopedia. You could read it every day. You can memorize it. It might make you smart. It might give you a head full of knowledge, but it ain't going to give you wisdom. Now, the Bible is different. On the surface, it's just another story. Take, for example, Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve and the Garden of Eden. Maybe you're thinking about two naked people standing in a perfect garden you know, with a, with a snake talking to them. I'm confident most people are familiar with this story. Well, they made a mistake. They ate the fruit that, that God told them not to eat. So God gets mad, kicks them out of the garden. And because of that mistake, everybody who's ever been born since suffers the consequence. And the consequences are we're going to die because the wages of sin is death. Now, when you first heard that story in Sunday school, it might have sounded a bit peculiar, particularly with the animals talking. But when you read it for yourself, I'm talk not, not other people reading it for you. I'm talking about you yourself. Pick up that Bible, dust it off, read it yourself with a seeking heart. Well, then that's a whole different matter things start to open up. Suddenly, Adam and Eve hiding in the trees with God walking in the cool of the morning calling out, where are you, takes on a different and more profound, deeper meaning. And that's how scripture is. Not only will it give us an insight into the spiritual world, but it will also open up our eyes as to what's going on in the material world that we find ourselves living. That's why they call it the Living Bible. It will speak to you where you are in the circumstances of your life. Consider the prodigal son. I probably read that story a hundred times. Maybe I, I read it and I related to the son. Maybe I read it and I related to the father. Maybe I read it and I related to the older brother. Because you see, scripture's like that. It's a finely cut diamond. And depending on what angle you find yourself at, what season you find yourself in, that's what you see. And you know what drives me crazy? All this talk, all this debate. Meanwhile, the, this book, the scriptures are becoming irrelevant because guess what? Nobody's really reading it for themselves and it's not changing anything. People come to church, hear a few verses, maybe a 15 minute homily and they go, amen, amen. But then they go back to their life and live it just as they always had. Hear me when I say the greatest amen you could ever give God is change. Because if you're truly seeking and you're reading for yourself the Word of God, it will change you as the flesh comes and dwells in you. It'll change the way you look at the world around you. It'll change the relationships you have with other people. You know, it's interesting, but hearsay is not admissible in court. When you testify in our legal system in this court, in this court, in this country, they do not accept hearsay. If you stand in front of a judge and say, well, I heard him say this or that, the judge will say, well, that's inadmissible in this court. But if you step forward and say, 
I saw this or I saw that, then the judge is going to lean over with the jerk because they want to know what you saw. And what I find so troubling in our church today is we spend all our time debating, maybe the atheists or maybe even ourselves, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin? Meanwhile, we should be out there in the world, this agnostic world we find ourselves living in, telling people about a man who changed our lives and continues to change us. Because you see, if you're not an eyewitness, then you can't reveal that to people. If, if all you got is a bunch of hearsay, well, then you really got nothing to say. But with that, let's, let's talk about our gospel. It's special. You'll find it in the 11th chapter of John. I invite you to read it. Because if you're not reading it yourself, then you're not an eyewitness and it won't change you. But before we get into this gospel, let's take a 10,000 foot flyover and just say in general, like a macro look. This gospel is about the fact that our world is sleeping, which is a very nice way of saying our world is dead. Now, of course, that's not something most people want to hear. I imagine if I saw you in Walmart and said, hey, you're dead. <laughs> you're a walking zombie. Nobody wants to hear that. Particularly the hour a week church going folk, they definitely don't want to hear that. They're going to get angry. They might even write a letter to the bishop. Well, my friends, I'm about ready to step on some toes and I got big feet, okay? Our gospel today, on the surface, yeah, it's about a man named Lazarus. He dies. Jesus doesn't get there in time to save him. But what if I told you that our gospel today is really about the fact that you are dead? And not only that, you should be glad you're dead. Which is kind of a weird thing to say. You're dead and you should be glad. But let's take a closer look. Jesus is two days away from a very sick and very good friend. Scriptures say that Jesus loved him. And when Jesus gets the word that he's sick, he says, this illness will not end in death. So I'm thinking the disciples are standing around going, well, okay, Lazarus, he's his friend. He's sick now, but he's going to heal him like he, like he heals a lot of people. But Lazarus is far away, about 25, 30 miles, which in the ancient world is a long way. It's like two-day journey if you're in a hurry. But there's a problem. Rabbi, the Jews were just about ready to stone you and you want to go back. So they're probably thinking, can't we just heal him from here? Can we do a remote healing? Do we really need to go back there? Because it's kind of dangerous, Jesus. And what does Jesus do? Well, he, he does what he always does. And he answers them in a way that they don't understand. A riddle. He says, are there not 12 hours in a day? If one walks during the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, I love this line. It's actually two lines. These lines represent a treasure chest. One could say that these lines are the key that will open the door to the whole thing. But we're going to slide this to the back burner for now. We'll come back to it later. Put yourself in the shoes of the disciples when they hear this for the first time. I mean, can you just see them looking at each other? What? What? Scratching their head. What does that mean? Why does he say it? What an odd thing to say. What does that have to do with anything? What are you even talking about? But Jesus goes on. So when he heard that he was sick, he remained there for two days where he was, which is an odd thing. My friend is sick, so let's just stay here. But then he says, our friend Lazarus is asleep, but I'm going to wake him. Again, what does that mean? Lazarus has died, and I'm glad for you that I was not there so that you may believe. So again, he's happy. I mean, think, can you imagine? I got to empathize with these disciples right here. He's died, and I'm glad. That don't seem right. I mean, he had the power to heal him. Why didn't he go heal Lazarus right away and save his family and his friends from all that suffering? Well, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, 
declares the Lord. My ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And you know, it always seems to go back to the same thing, that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the big lie. Remember the big lie? We know the difference between good and evil. We got this. And God is saying, no, you can't imagine what I'm thinking, and you can't imagine my ways. Lazarus has died, and I'm glad. I mean, imagine you went to a funeral of a friend and say, well, he's, he's dead, and I'm happy. <laughs> really, this is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back, and we will continue to talk about this amazing gospel that comes to us here as we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living. If you feel like you're being fed by this ministry, I would ask you to prayerfully consider a partnership with Daily Living and what we're trying to do here. A monthly gift of any amount that you feel comfortable with and I will send you a monthly newsletter and if you provide an email address, a script of the show prior to its broadcast. Just write a check to Daily Living, P.O. Box 339, Nitro, West Virginia, 25143. You can also go on the website at mydailyliving.com and give through PayPal, and together we can shine the light of the good news in a whole lot of dark places. What do you say we get back to the show? Welcome back to Daily Living. We are talking about the Titanic gospel raising of Lazarus. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. So not only is he dead, he's way past dead. In this culture, they believe that the soul would continue to hover around the body for about three days. But then after that, you're dead. So you're not officially dead until 72 hours have passed. This is why Mary Magdalene came to anoint the body of Jesus on the third day. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. So this is a close family to Jesus, Martha, Mary, Lazarus. Remember, Mary was the one who anointed the feet of Jesus with perfume and dried them with her hair. We know that Jesus, when he was in the area, would often stay with his family. This was kind of his home base, a, a soft place to land, as they say, but not today. <laughs> no, not today. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. In other words, you failed us. You did not come. Again, the big lie. This statement assumes that we know the difference between what is good and what is evil, and you have failed us. And now she's informing the Son of Man what he should have done. And as crazy as that might sound, if we're honest, we do the same thing all the time. We pray for someone to get better, and they don't get better. We pray for circumstances to improve, and they don't improve. We pray for divine intervention, and it doesn't come. And so our faith is shaken. God, why didn't you come? Does God even hear my prayers? Is there even a God at all? Maybe it's just myth. The crisis comes and our faith is shaken. Let's get back to the story. Mary, who's the other sister to Lazarus, does not even leave the house. She doesn't come out to meet Jesus. Now, I want to speak specifically to all church-going folks out there right now. Remember I told you I was going to be stepping on some toes. Well, here it comes. If you find yourself going to church every week, believing that Jesus is going to get you to heaven someday, listening to a 20-minute homily or so, and getting some hearsay, but you are not waking up every morning and seeking His will. More specifically, you are not waking up every morning and asking God's will to affect real change in your life. Well, guess what? You're not a witness. You're certainly not an eyewitness because you're not an eyewitness. You're not changing. Remember, the greatest response we can give God is change. The Word needs to become flesh, and it needs to dwell somewhere. Why not dwell in you? I mean, I'm just saying, he told Martha, your brother will rise. Martha replies, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. So, you know, Martha checked the box. She got the catechetical question right. She got a, cold, a gold star, but she's clueless. She says, 
I know he will rise on the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who believes in me will never, never die. Now this goes right over her head. So Martha goes and gets her sister Mary and says, the teacher is here and he's asking for you. So off she goes. And she makes the same accusation. Martha says, Lord, if you have been here, my brother would not have died. And then it says, when Jesus sees Mary and the others weeping, he becomes deeply perturbed. The Greek word suggests like a snorting of a horse, like an anger. And Jesus wept, which is the shortest verse in the Gospels. Now, I find it curious, why is he crying? Why? He knows that he's going to soon be raising him up from the dead. I would think he'd be smiling, going, well, wait till you see what's coming. But I've read commentaries on this question, and I don't know for sure, but it seems like the best answer to that question is that Jesus wept because he's looking out and he's seeing the wages of sin. He's seeing death, not just death physically, but eternal death, and he knows it's not supposed to be like this. The darkness that people walk in every day, it's not supposed to be like this. Now, remember our treasure chest? Remember the key to the whole thing? I told you we were going to get back to it. Remember how this, these lines are really the greatest secret that any man or woman could ever discover. If one walks by day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of the world. But one who walks at night in darkness, because of the light is not in him, he stumbles. Now you hook that up with, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even though he die, will live and everyone who believes in me will never die. Okay, you put those two together, well that's the key. It all begins right here. Now watch this now. Jesus goes to the tomb and says, roll away the stone. Now, I generally don't read from the King James Bible, but I do love this translation when Martha says, but Lord, he stinketh. <laughs> He's been dead for four days. So they roll away the stone. And Jesus calls out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. Now, it's not written in our scriptures. But I can only speculate that as Lazarus was dying, his last words from his mouth were, Lord Jesus, come. And here it is. My friends, so many of us are asleep. Maybe something happened to us many years ago, and a part of us just died. And we rolled a stone in front of it, and for years we've been trying to cover it up. So many of us practice habitual sin, day in, day out. All the while, we're wrapping ourselves in burial cloths, trying to hide the stench. Some of you watching right now gave up on Jesus a long time ago. But right now, you're hearing a faint whisper calling you through your stone. You want to believe, but you can't because you're so wrapped up in those burial cloths so tightly you can barely hear it. But honestly, by now, you've come, become quite used to the darkness and pretty comfortable in that darkness. So many of us church-going folk sleep in the pews week after week. We take away some hearsay, but it doesn't change us. We continue to cover the stench with burial cloths, figuring, I guess, that even though our habitual sin stinks, we ain't changing. So many of us have sealed ourselves off in spiritual slumber, and we can't hear. Martha can't hear them. Mary can't hear them. The disciples and the Jews, they can't hear them. In fact, the only one who can hear them is the dead man, which is revealing the key that we've been looking for. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. But my friends, if you ain't dead, you don't need a resurrection. Jesus says, Lazarus is dead and I'm glad. My friend, for so many of us, it is only once we realize that we are in fact dead that we even consider the notion of living and our need for salvation. And if any of you are out there right now thinking, well, I'm good enough, well, congratulations, you are definitely dead. 
Because as we have said ad infinitum, there is no such thing as good enough. Maybe you're hearing that voice calling you right now. Maybe it's faint, but you can hear it. If that's the case, what you're hearing is logos. And if you allow logos into your heart, it will change you. It will make you an eyewitness. Untie him and let him go. Now, did you notice that it was not Lazarus who removed the burial cloth? No. That's because you in and of yourself cannot do it. You cannot remove the burial cloths of sin of which you find yourself wrapped in. But I know a man who can. So my friends, let me challenge you this week. Find a cross. Take a good look at it. Stare at it in silence for a few moments. And then make this prayer. Lord Jesus, I bring you my dead and buried self. Untie me and let me go. Because that's what the cross is all about. If this world has got you convinced that you're living and that you're good enough, well then good luck. But if you know you're dead, if you know that there's nothing you can do about being dead, well, then be glad. Strain to hear that voice that is calling you right now and then walk out to meet him and the sunlight of his Holy Spirit and start living. You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? Be the reason somebody smiles today. This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs>